Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. lecture we will continue our discussion on elliptic partial differential equations. In the previous lecture we had tried to solve this problem of a square domain in which we had imposed four Dirichlet boundary conditions on the four sides of the domain and then we had taken a 4 by 4 mesh including the boundary grid points and then tried to discretize Laplace equation and solve it. So, just for recollection, we will try to remember what are the boundary values we had put. On the left end, we had put a value of 100 degrees centigrade. So, we marked it as F w and then on the north face, we had marked it as 300 degrees centigrade on the east face we had put 400 degree centigrade and on the south face it was 0 degree centigrade. And if you recall we had calculated an initial or guess value of 200 degree centigrade in the internal grid points. So, since we marked this corner grid point as 1 1 therefore, these interior grid points were marked as 2 2 3 2 2 3 and 3 3 respectively. And then we iteratively solved Laplace equation, but fortunately the solutions converged very rapidly and in the second iteration itself we found that we were getting the same values as in the first iteration that means, the solution had already converged. And then we had briefly assessed what could be the measures for convergence. So, either you base it on the difference in the functional values at each and every internal grid point where you are updating the values through an iterative approach or you try to take a global measure by computing the RMS error in convergence. Now, we recall that we had taken a 4 by 4 mesh including the boundary grid points. Now, of course, you can go about refining the mesh and then you will get much more detailed variation of the function as it matches up with these boundary conditions, which can be seen in a more refined mesh of 50 by 50 size. And therefore, you can actually figure out that the discrete jumps which occur on a coarser mesh are much reduced on a finer mesh. One issue which still remains is that at the corner points, what are the values of the temperatures we should be setting, though in the computational stencil that will not have any influence, there should be some reasonable ways by which you estimate those values at the corners. Because for example, at this corner which we can call as the northeast corner for example, because it is sharing part of the northern face and the eastern face of the, of the boundary. You could estimate it by taking an arithmetic average of the values that you have set at the four boundaries. So, let us say you can set a condition of 350 degree centigrade at this corner point and that is precisely what has been done here. Similarly, you can go about doing it at the other corner points, so that they are having an intermediate value between the sharing side temperatures. Again going back to finer mesh, you could refine the mesh further and make it say 100, and 100 by 100 mesh and then you have a still further increase in the resolution. So, this is what we call as resolution that means you are getting or capturing the 
finer details of the functional variation in the domain as you put in more and more grid points. That is usually how it works. And then ideally, if your discretization is an accurate discretization and with a fairly good uh, uh, order of accuracy, then as you put in more and more grid points, you are essentially approaching the analytical solution. So, if you refine it further and further, you will get finer details, especially where uh, the changes are rapid. So, when you have changes in temperature at the boundaries, there would be regions, especially at the corners where the changes could be rapid and then a fine mesh should be able to capture it better. So, there is one part coming from the resolution aspect. The other part is that how much computing time would it involve. So, for looking at that, you try to figure out that how many iterations are uh, taken in order to reach the converged solution. So, we have the issue of convergence. which is essentially the process of reaching the final steady state solution. So, the intermediate values that we compute are essentially having no physical significance. They are just lying on the path towards a converged and steady state result. But as we refine the mesh, more number of iterations are taken to reach it. So, on a 4 by 4 mesh, when you start with an initial value of the function as 0, and you set the convergence criteria to be 0 0.001 for each and every grid point to be satisfied, then on a 4 by 4 mesh it would take 17 iterations. Again on a 50 by 50 mesh it will take 3161 and 100 by 100 mesh more than 10,000 iterations to compute. Last time incidentally we had made an intelligent guess about the initial value we had taken an average of the boundary temperatures and set it as 200 degrees centigrade. Incidentally, we just took one iteration to complete. On a 50 by 50 mesh, it would take 1291 iterations to converge and on a 100 by 100 mesh, it would take 4161 iterations to converge. So, there are a number of things that we can easily understand. One is that in general, a more refined mesh will involve more number of iterations till you reach the steady state. The initial guess value would have an impact on how many iterations are actually needed before you reach a steady state solution. And then the other thing is that how stiff is your convergence criterion. So, let us say if you had relaxed this criterion and made it lower, let us say you made it 0 0.01, all these computations would take much less number of iterations. Of course, you cannot go any lower than 1, but for the other cases, it would take much less number of iterations in general. So, the convergence criterion, the initial guess and the grid size. So, these are the three things which have influenced the solution in a big way. And again, remember that when we reach convergence, there is a certain path that the solution is actually taking, which can probably be monitored better if you look at how the solution uh, tends to behave at each and every grid point. So, if you look at a specific grid point, let us say this grid point and then you try to monitor how the solution looks like, then you will see that initially the value of the function may be following a path like this and then oscillating about a certain value till it converges at large times towards a steady state value. So, that could be the way convergence is achieved. So, the convergence may take place through little bit of an oscillatory behavior till it actually steadies out. There could be other ways or other paths also through which convergence may be achieved, by the, but the final intention is to reach and ensure that convergence is reached. So, to sum up some of the learnings that we had through this activity. We will try to uh, recapitulate the main points once more. So, if we look at these points, we can recall most of the experiences we now have from this uh, solution. So, the 
f i j values they are being updated by averaging the neighboring grid values. We remember that uh, we were just summing up the neighboring grid values and multiplying them by a factor of one fourth to reach the value of f i j the updated value of f i j. So, this is essentially related to the physics of diffusion which is uh, modeled by this governing equation Laplace equation and the averaging operation to reach the updated value of f i j at a certain grid point is referred to as relaxation. When we talk about convergence in the context of Laplace equation, elliptic equations in general, we are essentially reaching a zero residual or near zero residual and that is the target that we have in terms of convergence. So, when we lay down the discrete equation for all the internal grid points, and we are trying to iterate the value of f i j at each one of the i's and j's of the internal points in an iterative manner. Essentially, what we are trying to do is we are trying to set this residual to 0 or to a very small value epsilon before we stop the computations. So, if you do this, you get the residual. That means, what is left on the right hand side of the equation? Is it a perfect 0? or a very, very small number or can we make it any smaller. And of course, all these equations are working on the basis that the grid spacings along the two directions are equal. So, now onwards until unless it is specified, uh, uh, we would in general assume that the grid spacings along the different Cartesian directions are equal. So, that just gives us the convenience that the governing equation simplifies significantly. As we iterate, we end up generating updated values of f i and j and as we do that, as we keep generating these updates, these are all intermediate values of f i j. They are not the final or the equilibrium or the converged distribution of f i j and they essentially have no physical significance. They are just lying on the path of convergence incidentally. They are absolutely not relevant in terms of the physics. The only physically significant solution is the equilibrium distribution which you reach at the end of the iterative exercise. Convergence depends on boundary conditions. Usually when we deal with purely Dirichlet boundary conditions, the problem convergence fast, converges faster. Whereas, if you have a mixed Dirichlet Neumann boundary condition imposed on the boundary, the convergence would in general be slower choice of initial conditions would also affect convergence and refining the mesh will add to the computing time, but that will give you better resolution of the physics. So, these are some of the things which we already realized from the result as we saw in the previous slide. And just to reinforce the ideas, we recapitulated some of the facts that we already saw through the example demonstration. This could be a good time to look at the matrix representation of the problem that we have been handling. So, earlier we had used a 4 by 4 mesh, incidentally here we are using a 5 by 5 mesh and we are still working with the square domain and you can make out that this is the south boundary, this is the west, this is the north, this is the east boundary. And now we have a fairly I mean, I mean a comparatively larger number of points in the inner part of the domain. Earlier we had 4 points, now we have 9 points. Now, if we were to write down the discretized governing equation for all these internal points, going by point by point and developing all the equations, the linear algebraic equations related to each point and then lay them in a matrix form, we would get a matrix looking like this. So, if we just look at the first row of the matrix, what it says is minus 4 times f 2 2 plus f 3 2 plus we skip 1 because its coefficient is 0 here. So, we go on to f 2 3 into 1. So, that is plus f 2 3 and then there are no non-zero entries anymore on this row. So, none of the remaining f's will figure here. So, that is equal to right hand side of that row which is equal to minus f 1 2 
minus f21. So, what is this equation? This equation is essentially representing the discrete form of Laplace equation for the grid point 2, 2. And what we have done essentially is left the unknown values on the left hand side of this matrix equation and sent the known values of the function to the right hand side which are coming from the boundary points that is 1, 2 and 2, 1. So, you actually can get the functional values here on the right hand side which are actually known to you from boundary conditions rest of the values are not known to you and they figure on the left hand side part of the matrix equation and the weightages are figuring in this matrix which we often call as the coefficient matrix. So, since we have 9 points, 9 inner points considered here we have a 9 by 9 matrix, 9 rows and 9 columns here. That is being multiplied by this column vector which contains the unknown values of f corresponding to each grid point and then what you have on the right hand side are the known values which are coming from the boundary points. This is somewhat similar to what we saw when we were discussing about compact schemes earlier. However, here we have a little more complicated structure of the coefficient matrix in the sense that here if you notice carefully the leading diagonal of this matrix has an entry of minus 4 all through and then there are two adjoining diagonals on the upper triangle and lower triangle and then another 2 at some distance and these 5 diagonals have non-zero entries. That is what gives you a pentadiagonal system of equations here and it is not easy to solve such a matrix equation very easily. So, if you were to go for some direct methods like Kramer's rule or cross elimination it could be quite expensive and therefore, that may not be an attractive proposal at all. Iterative methods of course, we have discussed the point Jacobi method as well as the Gauss Seidel method and they seem to be efficient, but we need to know strategies in order to make them more efficient and accelerate the convergence. So, some of these strategies to accelerate convergence and minimize the computational cost would be discussed further, but iterative methods seem to work well. If we at all want to solve this matrix equation through a more efficient manner, then there are ways in which we can do it, but then we cannot handle the pentel diagonal problem very efficiently. So, can we represent this problem as an equivalent problem involving tri diagonal system of equations, because we have discussed earlier that there is a tri diagonal matrix algorithm which is efficient and therefore, the computing costs could be much lower and therefore, that could be an attractive strategy to solve the problem by solving a system of linear algebraic equations. If you were to write down the same matrix equation, but this time you were looking at Poisson equation instead of Laplace equation, we had written down the Poisson form in this way with a source term on the right hand side. So, what you see is that in addition to the boundary values that we had obtained for the function, we would additionally have a source term here and the source term which is a function of x and y would then have to be computed at each grid point. And added on to the right hand side. 
recalling some of the iterative methods that we have already discussed. We have talked about the Jacobi iteration method, we have mostly used this technique in the numerical problem that we solved, where we update the value of the function at a grid point i j. The updated value of the iteration is indicated by k plus 1 and that is done by taking values from the kth level iteration from the neighboring points. So, that was the Jacobi iteration method, more precisely the point Jacobi method. Again, we emphasize that delta x is equal to delta y is equal to delta, this is inherently assumed because that makes the formula much easier to represent. We also discussed about the point Gauss serial iteration method, where we try to accelerate the convergence by making use of the latest available values of the function. So, by the time we reach the grid point i j, we should have swept past the, these grid points i minus 1 j or i j minus 1 and therefore, we would be having the updated values already available at those grid points and then using them on the right hand side of the equation would actually accelerate the convergence significantly. So, this is one of the strategies which can be used for accelerating convergence. And this convergence rate increase could be quite significant over the Jacobi method or the point Jacobi method. Now, as we apply these schemes, we have to of course, ensure something that the convergence is actually achieved. That means, you are going to move towards a certain value of the function at each and every inner grid point asymptotically and you are not going to keep on oscillating perpetually or not ultimately reaching a steady set state solution at all. So, what assures convergence? This is a very important issue, which is essentially ensured by the nature of the coefficient matrix that we had looked at a few minutes back. So, when you look at the coefficient matrix entries, you have to notice something that is if the largest elements in a given row are located, uh, sorry. So, the first point is if the largest elements are located in the main diagonal of the coefficient matrix and additionally at least for one row, you are ensuring that the diagonal, the main diagonal coefficient value is greater than the sum of all the magnitudes of the remaining elements in the same row, then convergence will be achieved. So, if we look back at the first, if we look back at the first row of the coefficient matrix, that will probably give us a better idea. So, we will try to look back at the coefficient matrix once more, just to make sure that we are able to get the numbers properly. So, we remember that the first row elements were in the diagonal, we had a minus 4 and then the remaining non-zero entries were one over here, another over here. So, if you look at the remaining locations, the remaining rows at all the rows, the main diagonal element remains as minus 4 and in every other row, if you notice, if you go to the second row, you have a 1 here, you have a 1 here and most other rows have that. The only exception is this row, where you have some additional ones. Well, there could be more over here, for example. So, you have 3 1s over here and a minus 4 here. So, it varies between 2 1s in the first row and that also is seen in the last row apart from the main diagonal, diagonal entry. 
and then in the second row for example, you have 3 ones, in this row you have 4 ones. So, they vary a little bit from row to row. Now, the point is we are just trying to figure out that whether we are able to satisfy the convergence criteria which is stated over here. So, if you look at this what it tries to say is that the main diagonal element the modulus of that is it greater than equal to the sum of the other entries in the same row that is what it tries to say. So, in the first row for example, you would actually do a calculation like this. So, what you have in the main diagonal is mod of minus 4 and that is actually happening to be greater than equal to the remaining. So, there were 2 ones. So, you are ensuring that 4 is greater than 2 here in this case and there was a middle row where there were 4 ones in the non diagonal elements. So, in that case it will exactly equal the diagonal element and therefore, in most of the rows you are able to ensure this greater than condition while in one of the middle rows you are able to get the equal to condition that means, you are able to satisfy this condition. And then what it says is that at least in one of the rows the diagonal element the mod of the diagonal element should exceed the sum of the non diagonal elements. Diagonal in the sense main diagonal and that is of course, achieved say in the first row, the last row and many other intermediate rows where you have 3 ones and a minus 4 in the main diagonal. That means, you have several such rows where you have even satisfied this condition. So, in general this method of convergence will work that means, with the coefficient matrix that you have for this problem that will be suitable in converging the solution. So, we have just cross checked that whether the coefficient matrix entries will ensure convergence or not. We will discuss about more schemes to solve elliptic equations in later lectures. Thank you.